We've been exploring the broad theme of refuge, which is particularly important during a time that's challenging, such as with the plagues of COVID and other things that are really turbulent these days. So how do we find refuge in different areas? And one of the key refuges is ourselves. If we don't feel comfortable in our own skin, if we don't have a sense of acceptance and allowing and even appreciation for who we are, uh, it's hard to take refuge in ourselves. And so last week I explored um, the refuge of accepting your experience, all of your experience, including all of your feelings and helping yourself, as I had to gradually learn to help myself when I finally went off to college, to wake down, not just wake up, uh, as Samuel Bonder puts it, and to really include my softer feelings, my vulnerable feelings, all of what I was feeling, rather than merely my intellectual thoughts from the neck up. And so last week was about accepting all of our experiences. Now, to be clear, and to make a point that we'll keep recurring as we talk about accepting parts of ourselves tonight, and the next week I'll talk about accepting other people, Oh, <laughs> working our way up the challenge level. And then ultimately, the week after that, accepting all the conditions in the world and in reality altogether. To be very clear, acceptance is distinct from discernment. We can discern things and we can discern what's problematic about them, bringing to bear second our values of various kinds. We can engage these qualities of discernment and valuing while also not resisting the reality of what we are trying to change. And this may sound initially kind of theoretical and abstract, but it gets clearer and clearer um, <clears throat> when you bring it down to experience, when you bring it down to practical, actual situations. Like for example, you walk into the kitchen or wherever, and you see that there's somebody hasn't done their dishes and their dishes in the sink, or, Think of some other example. They've left the cap off the toothpaste or they haven't flushed the toilet or whoever knows, whatever. And there's the reality that it is what it is. And notice that if there's this quality in your own mind of resisting the reality of it, of aversion to the reality of it, that creates needless suffering. That's a kind of inner collateral damage that can often create a lot of friction with other people. And on the other hand, we can discern that you know the cap was not on the toothpaste tube or the toilet was not flushed. And um, we can also have a value that says, hey, you know, it's better to put the cap back on or flush the toilet, let's say. Uh, we can have all that happening and then we can take skillful action as well without adding anger or resistance or tension to the fact of what reality is. It is reality right? Dare I use the troubled phrase these days? It is what it is. I mean, it is what it is while we can try to help it be better. So it's the combination of those two. It's summarized in the serenity prayer, summarized in lots of wisdom teachings in which discernment and valuing that is your own, your own, can exist alongside and accepting of the way it is. Okay. So I want to apply this to accepting all the parts of ourselves, who is very often the one being among all others that we are most judgmental about and most scornful of and most exiling of various parts of ourselves out into the nether regions or down into the basement behind a locked door. And this is territory that's uh, well trod in psychotherapy and in psychology in general. And I'll draw on some of those themes. And also I want to explore uh, three fundamental ways uh, that might be perhaps a little novel to you uh, in terms of accepting all of yourself. And remember, as Suzuki Roshi put it, you are perfect as you are and you could use a little improvement. So that's the paradox. Both are true. And uh, we can keep it all in mind here. All right. Okay. So um, let's see. 
Okay. So um, the first thing I'd like to say in terms of accepting ourselves is to uh, expand the way in which you regard yourself. For example, the classic model in psychoanalysis from Freud, you're probably familiar with it, is this division of the psyche into these three major elements. The ego, which is sort of the you know, core executive process inside us, and it's the part of ourselves we tend to most identify with, with off to the side, the id, the bubbling source of primordial passions of various kinds, remembering that Freud grew up in the Victorian age uh, and uh, he you know clearly was you know dealing with that acculturation so we have the id woo and then we have the superego uh, the kind of voice of civilization the voice of you know society saying you know what your standard should be and then we have this ego kind of beleaguered in the middle trying to negotiate between the primordial sexual aggressive id and you know the standards of civilization that say thou shalt not that's a kind of structure we have the structure of, of and notions uh, that were more expansive, let's say, coming in from Jung, and then neo-Jungians like Hillman and others uh, who talked about it's as if we have all kinds of subpersonalities that could be, to some extent, identified with archetypal figures like the various gods in ancient Greece or ancient Rome. You know, the part of the person that is, you know, Diana the hunter or the part of the person that is like Jupiter, you know, the father figure throwing thunderbolts, or the part of the person that is like, you know, a trickster part of oneself. These are the ideas that we have these different parts. So these are familiar notions. And um, one way to uh, re regard ourselves is that it's as if we are this little beleaguered ego, process surrounded by these other parts of ourselves that we're kind of alienated from and we're trying to keep at bay and they're so unruly and why won't they settle down and how come they keep getting me in trouble and ah you know it feels a little bit to me metaphorically like feeling as if we were endowed at birth as young children who are wide open. You know, they are all of who they are, right? D joyful one moment, sorrowful the next moment, hijacked by a part of them that wants the red truck, and another part of them wants to bonk their kid brother with the red truck, and then another part that's mortified when the parent catches them bonking their kid brother with the red truck, right? So we start out in this very expansive and inclusive way. And then if I could, I want to show you the blob theory of uh, the blob model of psychological development. Okay, so this is how we start. This is a visual aid. Can you see the circle there? Okay, circle, visual aid. And then <clears throat> life happens. And I'll use myself as an example. So let's say life happens and then you skip a grade and you have a late birthday and you're really young going through school. And also you're a little late to puberty. And so you start to feel like there's this part of yourself that's young and squirrely and picked last for sports teams and, and so embarrassing. And it feels so unmanly if I dare use that word. So you carve that part out. Nope, not me. Gonna exclude that part gonna leave that part out, gonna shove that part down. Whoa. And then maybe there's another part that you encounter, especially as you get a little older, and it's a part that can be very righteous and certain about how things ought to be and how people ought to be, and angry. And this part gets you in trouble too. Oh no, better leave that part out also. So now we have another part that's being left out, that's pushed down, disowned, shoved to the side. And then maybe there's another part of you growing up in a home that really valued rationality and control of yourself and was not very imaginative, was not very intuitive, was very sort of logical and linear. And that's how, you know, this kid, me, learned to be. 
But these other parts that were more intuitive, imaginative, and I'm going to use a word that could be problematic, I mean it in a certain way, parts that were a little witchy, a little out there, a little, uh-oh, those parts too, no, 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 carve them out as well, All right? So then, and I could have kept going, you find yourself just being conscious of the parts that remain with all these other parts carved out. And they're not carved out in a, in a sense like you can actually prune a bush and that branch is no longer part of it. They don't go anywhere. They just go underground. They're still there. You know, the parts of ourselves that we carve out and push aside, right? And then eventually we start feeling like, in effect, if we were born with this vast estate, it's as if we gradually withdraw into the gatehouse or the capital and look out on the swamps and forests and, and provinces, these different parts of ourselves, as if they're alien to us, living smaller and tighter and more beleaguered than we really need to be. That's a very common experience for understandable reasons, right? Um, and then you feel, as people are commenting here, very pinched inside here, as I very much felt when I finally, you know, I remember driving away from my home. I, I had wonderful parents, but for all kinds of reasons, I became very contracted in that environment. And I remember driving off to UCLA with all my stuff in my car. I was 16 and, you know, I, and I literally heard the song in my mind, freedom, <laughs> freedom. And I knew, I knew I had to find myself in a different setting to gradually uh, engage a process that could be safe enough to reclaim my own interior, right? To find all of that again. And I bet a lot of us can relate to this, right? I'm seeing comments that coming in. That, yeah, people can relate. So my first of three major suggestions tonight related to growing in self-acceptance is to regard yourself as the entirety of who you are and to have a growing sense, even without working on all these warded off, carved away, suppressed parts of oneself, just even before getting to that, which is, will be my second suggestion, some good ways to do that. It's a general sense of, of, as Walt Whitman put it, I am multitudes, just accepting the fact that we are all multitudes with many parts, many sub-personalities, many voices. Uh, it's as if there, there are many metaphors for this. You know, we are a vast land with many provinces. Yes, there is a place for developing a core executive process of, of discernment and values and will. There's a place for that. And if a person feels very fragmented and completely blown apart and scattered uh, as if truly they have multiple core personalities, that's problematic and, and difficult, right? So as, uh, you know, um, I forget his name, it'll come to me in a moment, said a psychoanalyst and a, and a, or a psychologist and a Buddhist practitioner, you have to be somebody before you can be everybody or nobody, right? So it's important to be able to have a kind of core process, but as you get comfortable in being this core process, of discernment, valuing, and willfulness and you know, motivated action, then increasingly you can regard yourself much more loosely, much more as the whole symphony, the whole village, the whole land, provinces included, the whole committee, even while recognizing there needs to be a place for the chair of the committee along the way. Then in fact, paradoxically, taking refuge in and trusting in the functionality of the core process makes it more comfortable and safer to include all the voices in the room. Just like in, in human meetings, and if there's a skillful chair of a committee, 
they can include all the voices and manage the fact that some of them need to, you know, finish now and hand the microphone off to somebody else, but they can make a spaciousness for everyone because they're a skillful chair. So you might want to ask yourself, how do you experience yourself, you know? And to what extent is there a, a suppressing of all of who you are? As people have written me in the chat, maybe because we're worried that if we reveal our true selves, others won't like it. And because they don't like it, we push it down and we treat ourselves as, as if we don't like that. Now, to be very clear again, I believe that there are parts of ourselves and in the biological evolution of the brain in which we all have an inner lizard, mouse, and monkey, metaphorically speaking, but somewhat related to the evolution of the brain. We, we do have these parts of ourselves. We can be very savage. We can be very hateful. We can be very addictive. We can be very possessive. We can do shitty things, to use a technical term. I hope you'll forgive it. Uh, we can do these things. Yeah, we need to regulate parts of ourselves, but we can regulate parts of ourselves while including and accepting parts of ourselves. And as I'll get to in a moment, respecting and listening to the wisdom they can offer and understanding the deeper wants in them and even forgiving them while feeling more and more that we are ourselves as a whole. Meditative practice like the one I did tonight and I'll talk more about this in my third suggestion, can really help. And there's good research that shows that as people deepen in their mindfulness practice and they develop trait mindfulness, they become more able to be aware of all the parts of themselves without being overwhelmed or hijacked by any single part. Very important point. So particularly if, like me, you grew up in a way in which you ended up, you suppressed, repressed, pushed away, disowned, were ashamed of, felt bad about revealing different parts of yourself. If you've grown up uh, socialized in cultures that want to suppress certain aspects of yourself, like there's a lot of research that shows that, that women tend to be socialized to the extent that category means something in terms of socialization, socialized to repress anger. You know, men tend to be socialized to repress fear uh, and the revealing of fear as if it's shameful, shameful to reveal that you're anxious about something. And so as the saying has it, you know, we end up with, you know, men who are afraid of women and women who are angry at men. Don't take that saying too far. Uh, so can we regard ourselves as, a, as the whole being? That's my first suggestion. Can there be a sense of appreciating yourself as the whole estate, the whole village, the whole committee, the whole symphony with all the instruments included? You know, and with that, can there be some awareness, some mindfulness, maybe with wistfulness and mourning for what you may have carved out and exiled in yourself? Okay. Second suggestion. In the context of this, there are many powerful, skillful psychological methods for including and integrating parts of ourselves and related feelings and desires and beliefs and history sometimes of interactions and even traumatic history with other people. There's a lot of psychology about this. And obviously my talk tonight is no substitute for professional treatment for any significant mental health issues. Um, and uh, for, as an illustration of that, there's the gestalt of th um, therapy approaches that talk about different parts. There are voice dialogue from House and Sidra Stone approaches that let different, that encourage different parts to have conversation with each other in, an, in a very accepting way. Richard Schwartz uh, with Internal Family Systems has done wonderful groundbreaking work and a number of people are increasingly trained in that approach that integrate different parts of ourselves that have been maybe warded off or mistreated or not really understood. They, they haven't been allowed to give voice. Many different approaches. I'm gonna summarize two things in particular or really three things in particular 
with regard to parts of yourself. And again, I'll, I'll use myself as a, as a bit of an example here. So if, if our aim <clears throat> is to be more inclusive and more integrated while also being regulated, because very often what happens is that if these parts get suppressed and, and pushed away, they sneak back out. And suddenly, you know, you find yourself talking to your family or your kids in the voice of your father angrily. Like I have found myself to my horror suddenly finding myself doing. Or maybe you relax your control a little bit. Maybe you have a couple glasses of wine and then suddenly a part of you is just coming out and it's kind of problematic, right? It's not well regulated. Just because we've shoved them down in the basement, you know, sometimes they sneak out and then things happen. So this doesn't mean that we ought to lock them up more in the basement because that's a short-term solution, if, if at all. But we can be more regulated. We can regulate while integrating ourselves. So three key aspects of that. And you might want to think about a particular part of yourself that perhaps you've been ashamed of or you feel is bad, maybe other people told you it was bad, maybe a part of you that really just wants to play and goof off and not do school, not get the job done, or maybe there's a part of you that um, is really pissed off, really pissed off. Like sometimes you can open these doors inside yourself and what comes out is a hot blast of rage. That's kind of nonspecific, or maybe even it's targeting a particular class of people like men, maybe, who've mistreated you or whatever, you know, okay. Imagine a part of yourself. And obviously, as you do this here, remember, this is not psychotherapy. Take good care of yourself here. So I'll use these two parts of myself, you know, one being this kind of shy kid um, who didn't, wasn't athletic as a kid. Later in life, I learned I'm moderately athletic, but definitely not a great athlete, but moderately so. Didn't know that when I was little, so I just felt humiliated a lot. So that's a part of me. So here are three things. One, deep down inside, what is that part of you wanting? And can you allow and accept and include and listen to what that part of you wanted? You know, I wanted that part of me to be seen as capable and competent including, frankly, in ways that were kind of standard more for boys, because that's how I grew up, to, to be a boy and, and, a, and a, a certain kind of a boy. What did it want? It wanted to be seen. It wanted to be befriended. It didn't want to be so, feel so embarrassed at PE when teams were picked for baseball, you know, and I was usually picked last or next to last. You know, Inside you, what does this part want? Maybe it wants a just world. Maybe it wants to be loved. Maybe it wants to be unshackled and just have room to be big and loud. And What does it want? And can you include the want of it? Deep down, all wants are positive. The deepest layer of all wanting uh, is linked to our biological nature and it's, it's pro-life in some way, even if it's expressed problematically. There's something, there's a, there, is, there are healthy wants somewhere at the root of even problematic wants. So they may need to be regulated in their expression. They need to be inappropriate at particular times and places to be fulfilled. But in themselves, the wants are okay. Can you honor the wants of these parts of yourself that have, may have been disowned, suppressed, exiled, and so on? Recognize the wanting in these parts. And can you accept it? Second, every one of these parts in their own way is trying to help you survive. They're trying to help you get through one way or another to the next day, even if they are very unskillful about it. And in fact, um, misguided and creating the opposite result. But deep down, they're trying to help you. Every single voice in the committee of your mind, uh, no matter how annoying, is trying to help you one way or another. Okay, 
How are they trying to help you? What's the teaching? What's the helping? Right. And, um, you know, what I recognize in that little part of myself, for example, fourth grade, third grade, you know, I was six years old when I started third grade, uh, you know, is a part that that's that was trying to help me be part of the group, to be included, and was trying to help me um, in my kind of sweet way to um, be okay and to engage life. And, you know, this part of me would lead me to move into wilderness and the orange groves around our home to explore because that was where it could be expressed. So it was trying to help me express healthy aspects of myself as an exploratory kind of person and someone who naturally has a deep affinity for nature uh, and is really interested in the world as a whole. This part of me, as I'm realizing even as I talk about it, was was very is very curious and it was trying to help me follow the thread of my curiosity out into the world. It was helping. So this part of you, does it have a, a lesson for you, a teaching for you? Uh, in, what's its function that it's trying to serve to support you in some way? And can you respect that? Can you appreciate that? The ways it's trying to help you. That's a second point here about these parts of yourself in the second part of my talk here. Third, can you forgive this part of yourself? Not just accept it, which has a kind of some, you know, kind of, I think, mainly a soft, receptive, quality, forgiveness is more active. It's, it's a kind of blessing. And, and if you can't forgive it, you can't forgive it. it has, forgiveness must be authentic if it's to uh, occur at all. But can you forgive this part of yourself or can you forgive aspects of it? Can you communicate an understanding of it as for why it did what it did, why it is the way it is. Can you give it the gift of forgiveness, this part of yourself? For myself, I can forgive the part of me that was shy and humiliated and embarrassed and felt weak and small and, you know, un uncool, unokay. I can, I can forgive that part. Can, I can forgive the part of me that uh, second part I referred to here that could get very righteously angry and critical and, and identified with that stream of criticism. I, I regulate that part and gradually it's dissipated and been uprooted in my mind, although it can still arise occasionally. Uh, but I, I can forgive it. Yeah, I, I know you. I know where you're coming from. I know why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't do that again. And yeah, I forgive you. Can you bring that quality of forgiveness to, to the parts of yourself that have been pushed away? Okay. And then as I move to the third part of my talk, and then I'll open it up for discussion, I see uh, lots of things that have come in here in the chat. Uh, related to that pond uh, meditation, which may have seemed kind of abstract at first, but with practice, you can start to be mindful of the ripples of experiencing. And then second, you can start to get a sense of being the streaming of consciousness as a whole, the mind process as a whole, yourself as a whole, second. And then as you gradually stabilize in that, you can even get, get a, start to get a sense of a kind of ground underlying your beingness as a whole, the mind as a whole, you know, rested in life, rested in reality, maybe perhaps rested in something that is unconditioned. So that's a, a powerful meditation and one that I encourage exploring. In terms of acceptance, you may have noticed that when you go out to yourself as a whole, 
there's this very wide sense of yourself as a whole, which neurologically can be supported by being aware of your body as a whole, or a room as a whole, or lifting your gaze to the horizon line if you want to open your eyes or just imagine it with your eyes closed. There's a sense of awareness, consciousness as a whole. Uh, I use suggestions, which you may not relate to, of, that op they work for me though, of kind of like widening or opening in all directions somehow. You, know, you go out to the whole. When you go out to the whole, you notice that whatever is present in that whole is okay. I mean, it is what it is. It may need to be regulated, it may need to be managed in some ways, but it's not a problem because you are identified with the whole of who you are. You are abiding as the whole of who you are. This may be hard to understand conceptually, but it becomes very clear experientially when you start to explore it. And um, you realize that you are just what you are as a whole. You're fine as a whole. Uh, mind as a whole is never a problem. There may be aspects of mind that are problematic and need management and regulation and you know, <laughs> releasing or encouraging, et cetera. But the mind process as a whole is always okay as it is because it is simply what it is. And this is something you might want to explore. Okay. So I have covered a lot of ground here. I'm looking now at the chat and seeing what kind of questions or comments may have come in. Um, <clears throat> all kinds of great comments and questions have come in. I'm not going to be able possibly uh, to encompass all of it. Um, what I would really just summarize and suggest to you is to to just kind of be honest with yourself about what you may tend to push out, push out of sight, perhaps because you've internalized social prohibitions about being that or having that as a part of yourself, and seeing if at least inside the privacy of your own mind, you can be more allowing and more including. You could even do little exercises with yourself where you imagine your mind is like a big house with different rooms, some of which are open, and others that are kind of maybe the, the door's ajar, and others that are boarded up and locked away as if there be dragons inside. And then just in your own mind, imagine what would it be like room by room, door by door, to be more inclusive of all of who you are, right? And with maybe some parts in particular that you've pushed away, um, can you recognize, you know, what they want, and maybe even give it to them in some way. So you get a sense of giving them what they long for, you know, and let and kind of help them receive it into themselves. Second, can you appreciate their function? Can you appreciate them? What they're trying to do for you in a genuine way. I'm not playing any tricks here. And can you forgive them? Can you bring forgiveness to them and a blessing to them, much as you would, to, and understanding to them, much as you would to someone else? And then last, can you explore, you know, opening your mind wide? In my book, Neurodharma, this is the fourth practice of wholeness, being whole, being your mind as a whole, being yourself as a whole, right? as a whole, allowing your mind process, your stream of consciousness to unfold as a whole, and seeing what that's like to be whole undivided. Okay. All right. So questions, comments, you okay so far? Accepting yourself. Yeah. And okay, good. All right. Let's see. How do you get in touch with those parts of you if these parts have been suppressed for a long time? Um, start easy. Just think about, you know, simple parts. What about a part of yourself that wants to be loved and it just feels uncool to acknowledge that you really do want to be loved, right? Or maybe there's a part of you that wants to be special. And I remember acknowledging this in a graduate seminar at EST, you know, in 1975. I, I want to feel special. And the workshop leader was very 
skillful and said, okay, stand on your chair, Rick, and we are all going to clap for the next 10 seconds about how special you are. And I want you to really take it in. It was like, oh my God, but okay, I went for it. And then, you know, there you are. So maybe there's a part of you that wants to feel special. What is it? Maybe there's a part of you that's just angry about certain things. And there are darn good reasons why you're angry about those things. You know, just start with something that seems pretty apparent. And then gradually, as as you become more integrated and this core executive process, the you know, um, is stable and viable and functional, you become more able to just include it all. You know, it's okay. It naturally comes forward for you. Okay. Well, okay, so then Christopher at the very end, can you speak to acceptance in the context of feeling stuck in constricting environments? Very important point. Where you feel the music inside cannot fully come out, where your sense of global meaning is stressed because of it. Yes, if certainly to be clear, if we're in environments where it's not safe, this is a really important point, to reveal all of ourselves, you can't do it. Safety first and foremost, and that's the truth of it. Sometimes we live in under occupation, in a sense. With, with the people we, you know, go to work with or go to bed with, and we have to be careful, maybe. And I want to be really clear about that. Or maybe just because of racial injustice or all kinds of things, we can't. It's not safe actually to be all of who we are. You know, like people who have more privilege can be all of who they are. So it's very important to be, of course, attentive to environments and to think about environments as best we can that are more like fertile ground for us. The people who actually want to hear us sing, they want to hear the music inside us. They're truly okay with that. And sometimes when you start exploring this, you realize there are certain people that will always disappoint. They really can't tolerate all of who you are. They don't want all of who you are. They really want to put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. And then, it, then there's some poignance there. There's fateful choices. There can be a grieving and a mourning as we face that. Um, well, meanwhile, looking for, um, you know, increasingly people who really support you. So I want to be clear, you know, I, my little talk here about be all who you are. Yes, while dealing with environmental forces that constrain and constrict us as best you can. Minimally, I find that it's helpful to, as best you can, carve out an inner freedom where you can really be yourself, distinct from what other people are saying, as best you can. If only inside your own mind or the privacy of your own journal, um, you know, or with your therapist or that one person, your rabbi, your priest, or maybe someone who's an imaginary, not necessarily imaginary, like an angel or a figure, uh, you know, archetype of a wise being, uh, if you had a chance to talk with Gandalf, what would you say? Galadriel. Man, I'd really love to hang out with Galadriel in the Lord of the Rings mythology. Uh, you know, imagining that. If you really bared your soul, revealed your heart, sang your songs with, with beings who would welcome that, what would that be like? You know, if only inside your own imagination. Okay. Um, Okay, Bonnie Rose, I grew up in a whole family of people who wanted to put the genie back in the bottle. What is the want behind their behavior? That's a very interesting question, and it will be a good segue into next week. Well, you, it's this is a helpful way to understand other people, even people who are behaving terribly. Under, underneath their terrible behavior, what is the wholesome want? It doesn't mean that in recognizing that we countenance their behavior. It can often give us a deeper understanding of what's really going on and sometimes can give us ways to um, manage them more effectively or to understand actually what they really want and reveal more clearly what their true agenda is in, in recognizing how deeply problematic it is. The truth is maybe they really do want to rule everyone. Maybe they really do want to ward off any possible feeling of, feel, of being small and, and bad by dominating everybody. Maybe that's really what they want. 
And deep underneath that is the healthy want of safety and comfort and ease, but it's expressed terribly badly. So sometimes understanding and discerning the deep wants in others can be really helpful to us. Other times we realize that, you know, like people who suppressed us really growing up, you know, like my own parents, they grew up in certain cultures uh, around the depression in which children would be seen and not heard. <laughs> that was their culture. That was what they thought being a good parent was about. And, you know, that was their want to have a nice family and to look good in the eyes of the world when they took the kids out to a restaurant for dinner and we were very proper and well behaved. That was what they wanted. And in understanding that, you know, uh, understanding my, my mom's depressive mood sometimes, understanding my dad's desire to, you know, have the home life kind of work out so he could just sort of focus on being a grad student and finally getting a PhD and a job. Um, you know, understanding that we can forgive them or sometimes. So, you know, we can understand these deeper wants in other people and that can help us come to peace. Doesn't mean again, turning a blind eye, doesn't mean letting them push us around because deep down their wants are, are wholesome, but it can mean a deeper, more peaceful, more accepting way of being in reality as a whole in the service of our own well-being and in the service of developing our capacities to truly make the world a better place without getting caught up so much in, in being at war in our own minds with the minds of other people. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, lots of great stuff. Got a couple minutes here. Dreams, dreams are fantastic in discovering hidden parts. Um, you know, Jung had a lot of great ideas, including the notion of the shadow. And very often you may have the sense in your dreams that there's some force that's trying to get you. It never quite gets you, but you can't escape from it, like your shadow. And it can be helpful to kind of imagine these aspects of oneself, which can show up in the dream as sort of creepy or disfigured in some way, like flawed or stained. You know, these are the parts of ourselves sometimes that we want to keep out. And so in dreams, as my uh, dream therapist uh, said to me once, you know, when the unconscious knows that you're listening, it will start communicating more with you. So dreams can be a wonderful way to have parts of ourselves come forward. Um, intense, non-ordinary experiences can be a way for this sort of thing to come forward. Uh, you know, visions, vision questing, journeying of various kinds can be a way for these parts to come forward. Art, drawing on the, you know, the other side of the brain, uh, as the book has it, can be helpful in really exploring who you are, all of who we are. That's lovely. That's lovely. Okay. Um... What do you think? Accepting yourself, all of yourself. You might even think about doing a little committee <laughs> drawing all the all the voices, all the subpersonalities, or some of the major ones. You know, this classic. And think about just different aspects. The wise child. So I'm going to name some. Maybe as as I finish here, see what if anything resonates. So one, drawing on Jung, to the extent this is meaningful to a person, uh, the anima, so the more feminine aspects of someone who identifies more as, uh, as male, or animus, the masculine, quote unquote, and obviously this can be controversial aspects within someone who identifies as female, classically. Different archetypes like the inner child, the wise child, the angry child, the misbehaving child, the selfish child who wants my cookie. Oh, yeah. You know, um, the voice of wisdom. Many of our parts are actually really wonderful. They're quite profound. The voice of spirituality, the, the you know, the Buddha within. If you relate to it, 
Christ consciousness, you know, whatever is, speaks to you. Um, you know, the tree of wisdom, the great mother, uh, just these archetypal figures, these parts of yourselves, the critic, the pusher, protector parts. Right? I like this. Have a tea party. Invite all those parts for tea. Welcome them instead of locking the door on them. And give give voice to them. See what that's like. Right? You know, in transactional analysis, the, the psyche is divided into the inner child, the critical parent, and the nurturing parent. Um, okay. Well, this was a lot, right? So how about we just kind of sit here with all of ourselves? All of ourselves. All of it allowed, all of it included. All of these parts of ourselves are actually processes. They are verbs, not nouns. The wise child process, the critic process, the protector process, the great mother process. All of these processes like currents deep currents in the total pond of who you are. Letting this land as we finish up here. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for being here for everyone here. And thank you for being here for me. <laughs> <laughs>